Thank you very much, Wendell, and thank God for bald-headed preachers. I've always said if it wasn't for my bald head, there'd be no fun at all in Knoxville. That's the source of many funny stories, and I learned a long time ago if you can't whip them, join them. So you just laugh about it and just rejoice in the, uh, in the gifts that God has given you so all you guys can appreciate what I'm saying out there. I'm just glad for the opportunity to be here. It's always a distinct pleasure to get to come. See, I, I'd want to come anyway if uh, uh, if I were not on the program, and this way I get a ticket to come and enjoy it all, and then all I have to do is prepare a lesson like this, and then I just sit back and, and soak up all the good things and take that book home and have it for good sermon material and class material throughout the rest of my life. But I really am uh, honored to be invited to participate on a program with men of the caliber of those that are here, and I feel like that it's uh, an honor to me and uh, whatever contribution I can make, I'm just glad to do that. And I commend the uh, church here for its love for the lost, for its love for the word, for the work of training preachers, and for its uh, strong uh, faith. And those things are delivered down to us from the apostles of Christ, and I encourage you to keep on keeping on and contending for the faith and preaching the sound doctrine of Jesus Christ. Now, Bible text uh, may be difficult for several different reasons. There are some that are difficult because our English translation leaves the intended meaning obscure. Some few are difficult because of the magnitude and depth of the subject matter. But others are made difficult because of their abuse by false teachers. And the three verses that we're dealing with today are difficult only because they have been confounded and confused by those of the religious world. And it's our job to point out wherein they've abused them. <clears throat> in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, Paul addresses the brethren, saying, Knowing how that our gospel came uh, not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. And the error that's based on this passage is that of the uh, Baptist folks. And they believe, of course, that the sinner needs a direct operation of the Holy Spirit to open their sinful minds and to make them able to perceive and respond to it. And hence they say the gospel alone is not sufficient to save the souls of the lost, no matter how sincere and how uh, desirous they might be of obeying God. In his book, Our Doctrines, uh, Harold Tribble, who is a Southern Baptist, writes and says, quote, it's not enough to read or to preach the gospel. There's the essence of the era. Before the harvest of soul winning can come, the Spirit must open the mind and heart of the unconverted to see Christ in the gospel. And if you've done much home Bible study with people, if you've discussed especially with, with the religious teachers of the Baptist, the Presbyterian background, you can see that this is a common belief held by them. But the actual meaning of the text is as follows. That is, the preaching of the apostle was not just a presentation of his own ideas. Rather, his message came from God and was accompanied by supernatural signs and wonders of the Holy Spirit which confirmed it and gave it the stamp of divine approval as being from God. Jesus had promised this in Mark 16, 20. These signs would accompany they of the apostles that believed, and as they went forth and preached, he went with them, confirming their word by signs which followed, Mark 16, 20. And of course, Hebrews 2, 4 mentions that the message was confirmed by the signs and wonders and manifold powers of the Holy Spirit. A similar thought is expressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. Paul said, My message was not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and in power. When a man went out and preached in that day, he could not open his Bible and quote to them some New Testament verse to substantiate his doctrine. He said the words as though they were of himself, but then the Holy Spirit gave him the ability to work a sign, to raise a dead man, to heal a cripple, to heal a blind man. And that proved that God surely must be with him and thus be confirming the message that he was delivering. So then the Word of God has a power. There is a power inherent in it, in its form that we have today. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God under salvation. Romans 1.16, Scripture has enough power to save every lost person on the face of the earth. It has within it the message of redemption. But then there was those miracles of power, those signs and wonders and powers that were demonstration of God's Holy Spirit that were given to confirm the message of the apostles. In Acts 1.8, you remember Jesus said, Ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
The powers were used to confirm the message. Now it has been written. It has been confirmed by the signs and powers. And therefore today we don't need a supernatural, miraculous confirmation from God. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10 tells us that some things were partial, tongues and supernatural knowledge, but when that which was perfect was come, that which was in part would be done away. That perfect thing, the New Testament, has been given to us today, and therefore those partial things, such as tongues, supernatural knowledge, they have been done away. And in the New Testament of God, we have the power of God confirmed. And in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we're told that the Scripture, being inspired of God, will make a man perfect and furnish him completely or thoroughly unto every good work. Could you think of anything that you would need then in your religious life, in your religious search to please God, that the Bible does not provide for you? So then, I would stress that what our religious neighbors claim to have is surely not of God's Holy Spirit. Because God would not contradict himself or would not allow the Holy Spirit to contradict itself in confirming messages. For example, would God allow a Catholic to claim to confirm his message through his alleged miracles? And then here is a Mormon over here with yet a different message, and he claims he can confirm it. And here are Pentecostals with still a different message, and they claim they can work theirs. But the Scripture says that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace in 1 Corinthians 14, 33. So then, God is not at working them. Whatever they're doing is not of God. We would know that it's lying signs and wonders, like Paul mentioned in 2 Thessalonians in uh, chapter 2. But they're alleged miracles or confirmation, their alleged direct operation of the Holy Spirit can't be the Holy Spirit of God at work because God would not be leading one man to salvation by faith only, another man by meritorious works like in Catholicism, another man by keeping the doctrines of the Mormon religion. So then the gospel faithfully proclaimed is the power of God unto salvation. It conveys it to every human heart who hears it and is willing to be obedient to it. And if a man will hear, believe, and obey, then he will have all of the power at his disposal that he needs to become a Christian. Paul could say, when he wrote in 2 Timothy 1, 12, I know him whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to guard that which I have committed unto him against that day. He had utter assurance that he was right with God. He could say that because he knew intellectually what he had been taught of God and we can know with that same assurance that we have committed unto Christ our soul and he will guard that which we've committed unto the day of judgment because he has told us so in his word. We must never fail to, to remember James 1.21 where James said, Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. So we don't need a direct operation of the Holy Spirit today. We don't need a supernatural confirmation like some of these denominational people claim. We need gospel preachers and Christian soul winners who will go out and teach the Word. And when we preach the gospel to every creature, they that believe and are baptized will as surely be saved as the Word of God is true and the God who gave it is true. Now, the second passage that we look at this morning is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, where Paul says, And the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit soul and body be preserved entire and without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this concluding prayer, the apostle is imploring the Lord to sanctify and consecrate every part of the entire being of each disciple that was receiving the message. Now, they had been set apart for the service of God at their initial obedience to the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 1, 2, he addresses his letter to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. They were already saints. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 tells when it happened. They were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. So this passage makes it evident that the sanctification that the Bible speaks of is not a one-time event. That is, they were set apart to God's service, but there is a growth in holy living or in sanctification. And so though they had been Christians some two or three years at the time that he writes this, he is saying to them that his prayer was that God would complete his work of sanctification, that they would grow to be more saintly day by day. As a child of God grows to higher levels of Christian maturity, 
he becomes a more thoroughly dedicated and consecrated servant to God. And we all know that in our life. Uh, we should be more holy today than we were back when we first began our life as a Christian. One, we have learned that which was right and that which was wrong. Two, we found the strength of God to put away those things which were wrong out of our lives. And so we've been growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Peter exhorted us to do. And so Paul's prayer is that uh, we should grow to be sanctified holy, and it also should be our goal as Christians every day to be more and more like Jesus, even as we sing. And there should be no nook or corner of our life that's left untouched by the influence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to express his wish that their sanctification uh, be uh, complete and their preservation be complete, he prayed for their body, soul, and the spirit. And so it raises the question about the nature of man. Three possibilities are before us. There is that of the materialist, that man is wholly mortal with a physical being, that he has no immortal spirit that can be distinguished from the body. And there are two versions of this. There is the religious version, which is espoused by Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Adventists, and others of that kind, and then the secular version of the atheistic humanist, and he, of course, denies that man is any more than just a beast. In their book, Let God Be True, the Jehovah's Witnesses write, also we see that the claim of religionists that man has an immortal soul and therefore differs from the beast is not scriptural. And if you've ever talked to a Jehovah's Witness, it's almost certain that within the first 30 minutes they've gotten around to denying the immortality of man. They've denied that he has a spiritual essence that will live on beyond the grave. Now, looking beyond that category, there are those who teach that man is a dual being with a body and a spirit, that the term soul and spirit are used interchangeably and synonymously in Scripture. And those who hold this view we call dichotomist. And then there is a third category, those who teach that man has a body and uh, he has soul and spirit as well. There are three aspects of man. Those are often called trichotomist. Now, as Christians who view the Bible as our standard authority, we flatly reject the view of the materialist. There's just no way it can be right. Scripture over and over again speaks of the immaterial spiritual nature of man. For example, we hear Solomon in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returneth unto God who gave it. Paul writes, Though our outward man is decaying, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. There is a part of us that lives on even though the body grows old. And 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We're willing to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So the body could be left behind and, and the we or the personality could go on to be with the Lord. These scriptures and literally dozens of others uh, amplify and uh, verify for us the fact that man is a spiritual being in addition to a material being and that the view of the materialist is wrong. But the second and third categories are not so easily uh, dealt with because uh, we have to decide which of those two would be right. And you can't simply go pick up a good commentary before you find Bible-believing men who honor and uh, admire and respect the Word of God highly, who are in both categories. Those of the Calvinistic school will nearly always defend the dichotomist view, that is, that man is body and spirit or body and soul, while those that are of the Anglican background nearly always will come forth with the trichotomist view, body, soul, and spirit. But since our commitment is to Scripture, we can't just say we agree with the Calvinists or we agree with the Anglicans. For us, it is what saith the Scripture, to the law and to the testimony. That's where we'll find our answer. Now, it's true that some verses speak of simply soul and body. Matthew 10, 28, we're to fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. But we must deal with those that suggest that man is a threefold being. Uh, for example, beyond 1 Thessalonians 5, where it says body, soul, and spirit, you have Hebrews 12, where the Word of God is quick and powerful and can discern or distinguish between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Now, there is a difference in a joint and a marrow, and there is difference then in soul and spirit, we would think. And if it's impossible to separate the two, would you not be saying that the Holy Spirit made a, a mistake in inspiring the Hebrew writer to say there is a distinction discerning between soul and spirit? And Genesis 2, 7 seems to make this distinction. Notice the scripture, God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's the body breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that's spirit, 
and man became a living soul. There's your soul that we speak of. Here we see the clay, the physical frame, the breath of life, the spirit, and the living being, which is the soul. The word body from the Greek term soma, and the body is referred to in Scripture as the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. It's a home, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 9. We can be absent from the body at home in the spirit. It is the outward man of 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Scripture speaks of the body as being weak. The flesh is weak, Matthew 26, 41. We have fathers of this body, Hebrews 12, 9. It decays, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. It dies, James 2, 26. The body, apart from the spirit, is dead. It returns to the earth and becomes dust again, Ecclesiastes 12, 7. And the body will be raised in the resurrection, incorruptible, glorious, and in power, suited to live with God throughout all eternity, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 43. Now, the word spirit, the Greek pneuma, is a word that's a little more difficult to define. W.E. Vine gives 17 different connotations for the word pneuma. And concerning its nature, Jesus said, A spirit hath not flesh and bones. Luke chapter 24, verse 39. The spirit is said to be eternal in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. The outward man is decaying, but our inward man, the spirit, you know, is being renewed day by day. The spirit is invisible. John 3, 8. The wind bloweth where it will. You can see the evidence, but you can't see the wind or the spirit, nor can you see the soul of a man, the spirit of a man. It resides within the body in this realm of life. Daniel's spirit was grieved in the midst of his body, according to Daniel 7, 15. And God is said to be the father of our spirit. Should we not be subject to the father of our spirits and live? And God forms the spirit within a man, according to Zechariah 12, 1. And at death, the spirit returns unto God who gave it, according to Ecclesiastes 12, 7. In death, the spirit retains consciousness. We see both Lazarus and the rich man in the place of waiting, the Hedean realm, one saved, one lost, and yet both of them conscious, according to Luke 16. And it is immortal. It's being eternal in existence. While the body is decaying, the inward man is renewed. We want to be absent from the body and at home with the Lord. And, of course, when we understand that uh, we are going into an eternal realm and the body that we presently have will not accomplish or accompany us there, we can appreciate that. The third word is the word soul, called uh, suki in the Greek. And it's assigned ten various meanings in the lexicons, and it differs from the spirit and generally means life or the natural life of the body. And we'll go into a little more detail about soul and spirit now, and perhaps it'll help each one of you be able to make the distinction. In the pulpit commentary, Gloag, in his uh, discussion, says each of the two words, soul and spirit, is sometimes used for a whole invisible nature. And there's where a problem comes in. Sometimes the words are used interchangeably for the invisible part of man. But when distinguished from the spirit, the word soul is the lower part of our immaterial being, which belongs in common to the animal life creation, the seat of appetites, desires, and affections. We all have a soul in the sense that we have life, like the animal has life, you see. You shoot me in the head. I lose life. You shoot an animal in the head, he, he loses life. But there is in man that which is different. There is something in man that when the body is killed, when life is taken away, the spirit returns unto God who gave it. You do not read such of that concern of the animal. Again, Gloag says, the spirit is the highest part of man which assimilates him to God and renders him capable of religion, susceptible of being acted upon by the spirit of God. The soul is the inferior part of his mental nature, the seat of his passions and desires of the natural propensities. The body is the corporeal frame. And Henry Alford, who in his commentary says, the spirit is the highest and distinctive part of man, the immortal, responsible soul in common parlance. So we frequently say, may the Lord bless his soul. May his soul rest in peace. We're thinking about his spirit, are we not? That which is immortal that goes on to uh, wait in the Hadean realm for the resurrection. The soul here, he says, is the lower or animal soul, that is, life, containing the passions and desires which we have in common with the brutes, but which in us is ennobled and drawn up by the spirit. So the body you know, spirit is the immortal part of the man, soul normally means the life or that part of us which is our lower nature, your appetites, your desires, and such as this. W. E. Vine, in his Expository Dictionary, observes that the spirit may be recognized as the life principle bestowed on man by God, the soul as the resulting life 
constituted an individual. And in a minute we'll look at it, but here was Adam, a hunk of lifeless clay that had the appearance of a man. God breathed into his nostrils spirit, the breath of life, and he became alive, a living soul, you see. According to James 2.26, the body apart from the spirit is dead. And conversely, the spirit's presence in the body causes life. And this is demonstrated in Genesis 2.7, which we just referred to. Thus, the soul in the more technical sense is biological life, which we share in common with all other living creatures. The spirit is that which is uh, from God and makes us distinctly God's offspring, Acts 17.29. Cattle are not, but we are God's offspring. Dogs and cats are not, but we are his offspring. Why is that true? Because he is the father of our spirit, according to that passage in Zechariah 12.1. Now, T. Pierce Brown wrote one of the finest little articles. And by the way, our brethren have not written much on this. I, I exhausted the files. I went back through 30 years of gospel advocates and firm foundations and other brotherhood to papers that I have in my files looking for articles on this and found about a half dozen, by the way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a tough one that we've all maybe kind of just shied away from, I think. But Brother Brown had an illustration which I thought was extremely good. He says, take an electrical light bulb. The bulb represents the human body, the electrical energy that flows into it, the human spirit. And when that enters it, the resulting light and heat represents the soul. And applying the analogy back to Genesis 2, 7, he noted, man formed a light bulb of the elements of the earth channeled into it electricity, and it became a shining light. God made man of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And I think that makes a very good illustration. In death, the spirit leaves the body, according to James 2.26, returns to God, Ecclesiastes 12.7, and it awaits a resurrection in the Hadean realm, according to the passage in Luke 16.22. The result in death is the end of physical life. But the Spirit, of course, lives on and is waiting for the resurrection. Now, in heaven, in the eternal realms, when the resurrection occurs, the Scripture indicates that our inward man, our spirit, will receive a new body, a glorified body. 1 Corinthians 15, 42, it is sown a natural body, but is raised a spiritual body, and the resulting life will go on eternity. in eternity. This mortal puts on immortality in the resurrection. If we're alive when Jesus comes, we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of the eye. The mortal becomes immortal. This body that's suited for this earth is somehow changed and suited for the eternal realms. But you see, while we're waiting for the resurrection of the body, we're in a spirit form only. And so you have in the uh, region of Abraham's bosom of paradise, Abraham in torment, the rich man, waiting for a resurrection. And then we'll be clothed, we'll not be found naked, but in Paul's terminology, clothed with a new body. Concerning the role of the soul, Vincent says in his word studies, the soul is the principle of individuality, the seed of personal expressions, having a side in contact with the material element of humanity as well as with the spiritual element. It is thus the mediated organ between the spirit and the body. Now, if you'll look in the book, we have a little pyramid. And at the base of it, we have the body. In the center, we have soul. And at the apex or top, we have spirit. You can understand that soul would fit in the middle there. The soul is the part of man that's intellectual, that has to do with his mind, with his emotions, with his spiritual feelings. And so it interacts with the body in that direction. But also, it's very closely identified with the spirit, which is the eternal, immortal part of us. And it uh, is influenced by that and has influence on that. And uh, Linsky comments that the spirit of man ought to rule supreme in his life so that we are a spiritual man, wholly controlled by God's spirit, and in that we would be pneumatikos, that is, one who is a spiritual man. But when sin comes into our life, it allows the soul to dominate so that we become sensual or sukikos. His bodily appetites have sway. And so here you have a man who has an immortal spirit within him, and he's made in God's image, and he maybe even has become a Christian and been born again, and yet he becomes influenced by the affairs and cares of this world and becomes a, a worldly, fleshly, carnal, sensual Christian, you see. He's dominated by the soul rather than by the spirit. 
it's kind of like that man in Romans 7. Paul said, I knew what was right, but I ended up doing what was wrong. I had a desire to get rid of sin and to live for God, but in reality I ended up practicing sin and disobeying God. That's a man who's under the influence of the soul. His bodily appetites hold sway. The Christian soul should be controlled by the spirit, while the soul of the sinner or the pagan runs away with the spirit and gives rein to the flesh or to the body. The fact that the term soul and spirit are used interchangeably makes it extremely difficult sometimes. But we'll conclude with a, a quote from Brother Woods that I think is a good summary. The soul as it relates to man is a generic or general term. The spirit is a specific term. In such a frame of reference, it is easy to define spirit. It is the immortal nature infused directly from God. He is the father of our spirits. The soul, being generic, relies on the context to indicate its meaning and used in the following four ways in Scripture. One, the whole person. Eight souls were saved through water there in 1 Peter 3.20. The physical life which man possesses in common with the lower creation. God spared not their soul in Psalm 78.50 includes men and beasts. The intellectual nature and higher spiritual nature. The natural man of 1 Corinthians 2.14 is the man who is a soulish man, if you'll notice. And it is sometimes used synonymously with spirit. And if we'll keep these facts in mind, then it'll help us in our interpretation of verses that have to do with soul and spirit. The last one of these has to do with traditions. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, So then, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions you were taught, whether by word or by epistle of ours. And the point of discussion would be, if this passage says hold traditions, and there are other verses that say that con uh, traditions are condemned, do we not have a contradiction? But we know that God does not contradict himself, so there evidently must be multiple meanings to this word traditions that are used in the New Testament. The word is paradosis, and it's rendered traditions in our English Bible, and it literally means a handing down or a handing on to hand over or to deliver to another person. Thus, really, anything that's passed on from father to son, from one generation to the next, is a tradition. It can be a good tradition or it can be a bad tradition. In the New Testament, we read of the two kinds. Those originating from men, we are to reject. Those originating from God, we are to hold to. Paul warns us against those who make spoil a man through their philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and not after Christ in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Obviously, any tradition that had its origin from men and is the production of men is not healthy for us religiously. To the Galatians, Paul wrote that he had been zealous for the traditions of his fathers. Galatians chapter 1, verse 14. He here speaks of the traditions of Judaism, which were of human origin. And you remember, they had many of them. One of the most notable that we read of the New Testament was their tradition called Corban. In this doctrine... A man was able to say to his aged parents, I'm sorry, I cannot help you financially because that wherewith thou mightest have been blessed has been given to God. And it was called Corban. And they said, that is the Pharisees, that if you gave God a certain percentage of your income, that therefore you were no longer under obligation to help your aged parents. But Jesus pointed out, since the law of God said, Honor thy father and thy mother, this obviously would include caring for them in their necessities of old age. And Jesus says, In vain do you worship me, teaching for your doctrines, the commandments, the precepts of men, according to Mark chapter 7, verse 7 through 13. See, here was a tradition that caused the word of God to be voided in their life. Any tradition that keeps us from doing God's will in our life is obviously wrong. Now, there's a host of these in the religious world. Veteran Conway, in his book the, uh, that has to do with question and answers about Catholicism, uh, cites the Council of Trent, and he gives us this quote. He declares that his church receives and venerates with equal affection of piety all the books of the Old and New Testaments and also the said traditions preserved in the Catholic Church. Now, you see then what we've all known down through the years that for Catholicism, it's not just the Bible and the Bible alone. They say the Bible and our canon laws or our traditions constitute our authority. And it's very evident, if you talk to them long, that usually the traditions of men actually overshadow and take precedence over the Word of God. 
If you ask them, well, why do you call your, your priest father? Well, it's a tradition among them. But the Bible says in Matthew 23, 8, 9, we should not call any man father on earth. But the tradition takes precedence. The Scripture says that Christ is the head over all things to the church. But tradition says that the Pope is head of their church. And tradition takes precedence over the Word of God. And so in such a case as this, we see men letting the Word of God be made void in their life and in their practice by the traditions of men. Now, the Scripture talks about divine traditions. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, If any of man obeys not our word, our traditions that he had received from the apostles, he walks disorderly, and we're to withdraw our fellowship from him. So then there are traditions that are important, biblical traditions. If any man obeys not a word, by this tradition, you reject him. Well, these are the traditions of the apostles given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Literally, the things passed on from Paul to Timothy, from Timothy to his disciples, on down to us today. And it's essential that we hold tightly to these. Then there's a third kind of religious tradition, not mentioned in Scripture, but one that ought to be mentioned, and that is a traditional way of doing a thing that God has commanded. Such traditions as these are harmless and innocent so long as they do not lead us to make void the Word of God. For example, traditional time for services. We normally I have our worship at 10 or 11 on Sunday morning, 5 to 6.30 on Sunday night usually. There's a traditional method of distributing the Lord's Supper. You sit there and we bring it to you in some method. There are hundreds of other traditional ways of doing things. But we must be careful, brethren, that we never allow our traditional methods to become laws, to become burdensome to people's souls, that we would reject a brother because he would do something different than our tradition. And we have problems with that. And if you don't think we do, you just decide that you will not have the tradition of Wednesday night Bible class. I'll assure you that some folks will think you have gone liberal if you break that tradition. Scripture doesn't demand you have a midweek Bible study. It's a good one. I'm all in favor of it. I never want to do without it. But just try to break it. Scripture doesn't command us to have a Bible class at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, but just break the tradition and don't have one. Well, I'll guarantee you a preacher proposed it would probably get churched, you know, pretty quick. Well, we need, to, we need to understand things that are traditional this way are good as long as we do not make them oppressive to the souls of men, as long as we do not allow them to make void the Word of God in some other way. Now, the thing that, that we need to remind ourselves as we look at the world is that both Catholic and Protestant bodies are filled with uninspired traditions that have now been elevated to the position of divine authority. I remember a few years ago when a seven-year discussion period went on between the Disciples of Christ and the United Church of Christ, which, thank God, we're not related to, and the thing that kept them from merging was the role of traditions in their respective churches. That was a big thing. They had no dispute about the Bible. Neither one believed it very much. But the traditions, the traditions really created a tension point. They just couldn't work that thing out, you see. And may we not let that happen. We look to the law and to the testimony, and if it's not written therein, there's no light in according to Isaiah 8.20. Isn't it amazing that the most remarkable book in the world, some 1,300 pages in content, dealing with the most profound moral and spiritual question of the ages, has so few difficult texts for our consideration? One small book out of all of those, by far the greater part of it can be easily read and comprehended by the most humble student, even a little child. And may we never cease to thank God for this matchless gift, this marvelous gift of his holy divine word, inspired by the Spirit of God, that's a lamp to our feet and a light to, a light to our pathway. And may God help us to love it, preach it, believe it, and defend it against all of its critics as we live our life.